Here's a small maths challenge for you. What's the answer to this equation? 4 plus 5 times 32 minus 2. Did you come up with the answer 286? Or was your answer 154? What about 162? This ambiguity is not only confusing, but leads to completely different answers. Now we tried to avoid this by having rules. You might have been taught various acronyms at school, learnt about order of precedence, or just thought, stuff this, I'll stick brackets around everything so it's dead obvious I'm a programmer. What if you're trying to make a calculator to do this? Have you ever tried programming a simple calculator in a programming language? It's one of those things that seems fairly straightforward. You have a string full of the maths, and your code just goes through the string, doing the maths on the numbers probably with a bunch of if statements to work out what operator to use. Except it's not that easy, is it? If you think it is, go and give it a go, then come back. We'll wait for you. It's quite a fun challenge, isn't it? You see, there's ways that we need to deal with the brackets, and what if you type things in wrong? Well, calculators have become little computers in their own right. Today, you just shovel your maths in, and the calculator knows what to do. It wasn't always this easy. Let's look at some of the challenges that had to be overcome. Along the way, we might accidentally invent the computer. The concept of a calculating machine has been around for centuries, but it wasn't until the 1970s that an electronic calculator that we might recognise today was produced. Back then, the world was obsessed with making a portable calculator that could fit in your pocket. That was the thing, it had to go in your pocket. We had desktop size ones, pocket size was the thing. It was like the iPhone of its day. Think of all the technological advances that needed to happen to make that work. Things needed to be battery powered, have small displays, some kind of processing that didn't take up the same space as a shoebox. Sure, calculators existed before then, but like the computers of the time, there were large devices made from discrete components. This was the 1970s though, and technology was about to make a giant leap forward. We have commit and we have lift off at 2.13. A recent startup in California, known as Intel, had recently been formed for the purpose of making DRAM chips and they were approached by a Japanese company called Busycom, who wanted them to create a calculator that used integrated circuits. This design would turn into the Intel 4004 microprocessor, one of the first of its kind. And like any new technology, all the main people involved, either accidentally or deliberately, ended up working with each other or against each other in that strange tangled way that history seems to create. The designers of the 4004 would go on to also create the Intel 8008, which would evolve into the 8080, which would then also go on to create the Zilog Z80, and later the 8086, that has now turned into the CPU that's probably in your computer today. Unless you have an ARM-based device like a phone, or a Mac. In which case, the design for your device's CPU was created on BBC Micro, itself using an MOS 6502 CPU, which was a chip designed by some of the people who designed the Motorola 6800, the 6800 being influenced by the Intel 4004. Also during this time, a Texas-based company called CTC, which later renamed itself to Datapoint, who was known for making mainframe terminals, had ideas about making smart terminals with their own processing ability. This required a processor. What they produced would eventually turn into the old smothering PC revolution that we still have today. There's a period in history where we had giant mainframes. People knew what computers were, but wanted smaller devices to go on their desks that didn't require constant maintenance to operate. Pretty fascinating how the world is now consumed with making computers, 
and putting them in everything. Go back 50 years, the obsession was calculators. Anyway, enough history. If the history is interesting, there's several books on it and a Wikipedia article that's pretty interesting. I'll link it all below. Let's get back to calculators. How do calculators work then? Yes, I know, you press the buttons and they do the maths. But what's going on inside them? The basic ones aren't computers, there's no CPU, it's not running code. Your average four function calculator mostly consisted of logic gates and some small pieces of memory. That was the whole point of trying to create an integrated circuit. Jam all the technology in a small package. Then have the idea that maybe it could do more than add and multiply. But we'll get to that in a minute. So these early calculators were quite primitive. As you push the buttons, the input went into a small amount of memory. When you press an operator like add, that function was performed. So you press one, then you press add, and the calculator would go into add mode. And then it expects the next thing to be a number. If you give it something else like subtract, it just switches into subtract mode and expects the next thing you press to be a number. Once you type in the second number, it waits until you either press equals or another operator. Then it does the maths and gives you the answer. Trying to do more complex multi-stage arithmetic like the thing at the beginning requires some effort from the user. Either you have to break the calculation into stages and feed them in one at a time to your calculator, or you need to understand how your calculator does its maths so you can type it all in in one go. On a modern calculator, this is much, much easier. Pretty much every calculator now is either really a small computer running software or it's a purpose-built chip that contains decades of refined functionality that is probably trade secret. They have parsers and can understand algebraic notation. This is actually one of those more difficult challenges than it seems. It requires more than just taking each character of input and working on it as it's being seen. You first have to have a parsing algorithm that has to scan through the input looking for mistakes, like missing brackets. Then, something called Alexa has to analyze the meaning of the input and break it down into a tree that can be traversed to compute the answer. All of this requires processing capabilities, memory, and other things that early calculators couldn't yet do. But as we're about to see, that didn't mean early calculators were incapable of doing complex maths. In 1972, while Intel and friends were still trying to accidentally kickstart the computer revolution without really knowing, Hewlett Packard produced the HP 35 scientific calculator. It could not only do basic arithmetic, but could also carry out scientific calculations involving sine, cosine, and logarithms. Things that traditionally would have involved tables in books that people used to look up the numbers. And it did all this with a processor that works serially, one bit at a time. Serial processing like this is a way of dealing with the lack of RAM. In fact, that's why we call memory RAM. The R means random as a complete distinction against serial. You see, RAM was expensive to produce. Serial memory wasn't. It could be done with things called shift registers. They're devices built from small logic circuits known as flip-flops, which can store the state of a single bit. If you chain a bunch of flip-flops together, they can send their output into the next one every time you give them a clock signal. And if you put them in a loop, they can continually remember some data. That's how memory used to work. Once RAM that was random had been invented, it was a much more superior way of storing data because you could get to any bit you wanted. You didn't have to wait for it to cycle round. The HP 35 used a technique known as reverse Polish notation or RPN for inputting its data. It's a way of entering instructions to a computer and being completely unambiguous with its meaning. It relies on a computing concept known as a stack. A stack is a data structure that works exactly the same as a stack of plates. Each plate can contain one piece of information, and they're piled on top of each other. This preserves their order. The only way to get to a particular plate is to take off all the ones above it. This is known as popping. Putting a plate on the top is known as pushing, so you push things into a stack and pop them off the top. You can only get to the top one. 
When a plate is popped off, you have to put it somewhere. This is what the memory is for. Now RPN works by using this stack and by the convention of what is known as postfix notation. So here's an example using our 4 plus 5 times 32 minus 2 maths from the beginning. So to express this as RPN, we need to switch it all around into a somewhat confusing mess. So we have 5, 32, multiply, 4, 2, minus, plus. Here's how that's used. So first we push 5 and 32 onto the stack. Then we get the multiply operator. When the multiply operator happens, it pops off the top two items from the stack, multiplies them together, which gives us 160, and then puts it back on the stack. Then four and two are pushed on the stack. After that, the minus operator will pop off two and four, subtract two from four, which will give us two, and push that back on the stack. Then the plus operator will pop off the 2 and the 160 from before, add 2 to 160 and give us the answer 162. RPN wasn't just confined to early scientific calculators. The fourth programming language made extensive use of it. Coincidentally, it was also created in 1970 and was used on early microprocessors we've mentioned earlier. The simple, unambiguous way of using a stack to store information was perfect for the early machines back then. They simply didn't have enough power or storage to do anything more complex. This was a time in computing where the human operators had to do some of the computer's work beforehand. So back to today, with our multi-gigahertz CPUs and smart devices that contain more power than a desktop computer from 30 years ago. Is this all just a historical curiosity now? Well, sort of, but not quite. You see, in your device right now is making use of a stack. Every time code in your device executes a jump instruction or calls a subroutine, the return address of where it needs to go back to, along with data to be used in that function, is pushed onto the stack. Inside the function, the first thing it will do is pop off a certain number of items to get that data. Then when the routine is done, the return address is popped off, so it knows where to go back to. That's how your programs don't get lost when they return from functions. We like to think of our devices as being highly sophisticated, but when you strip back the layers of abstraction, the basic workings are still built on the original ideas from these early periods in history. One of the things I'm interested in is how things start. That could be how a CPU boots up when you first give it power and knows what to do. Or it could be how the idea of a CPU was even thought up. What steps led to its invention? If you also find this mix of history and deep inner workings interesting, consider subscribing as I've got some more ideas for videos like this that I'd like to explore in the future. So until next time, I'll see you later.